You're listening to a Roddenberry podcast. Don't touch that dial. We'll be right back. We'll have more news this evening, but first, the latest genealogy, a Roddenberry podcast. Episode 21 The Command. Welcome to Mission Log Genealogy. I'm Earl Green. And I'm Norman Lau. Each week on Genealogy, we're hitting the books pretty hard to explore Gene Roddenberry's early television writing work years before he became known as the creator of Star Trek. This week, we follow Gene back to the campus of West Point, the 1950s military series on which he was a staff writer, telling the story of The Command. Earl will be back with trivia in a moment, but first, here's how you can reach us. Genealogy is meant to be entertaining and informative, but it's also the beginning of an ongoing conversation about the works of Gene Roddenberry. Drop us a line at missionlog at roddenberry.com and join us on X, formerly known as Twitter, and Facebook at Mission Log Pod. While you're at it, leave us a review and a rating at Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast platform, and please remember your comments could be used on future installments of Genealogy. And now... This week with a command performance is Earl with this week's trivia. Thank you very much, Norman. According to IMDb, at least, this is the 21st episode of West Point and aired on February 22nd, 1957. Now, a little programming note here. From here on out, there is significant uncertainty and some conflicting information about the air dates of Gene's remaining episodes. So while... An effort has been made to cover this show in as close to chronological order as we can, given the available info. There is less certainty about air dates from here on out. And we are at the halfway point, the fifth of Gene's nine scripts for West Point. The on-screen credit is unusual this week. Screenplay by Gene Roddenberry, from a story by Gene Roddenberry and Jack Bennett. Unfortunately, I couldn't find a single piece of information about Mr. Bennett. Not on the internet, and not in print. He's not in Gene's biography, and his name doesn't show up in any of the other books I refer to on this period of American TV. The IMDB listing for this episode of West Point does not reflect Mr. Bennett's on-screen credit. So, someone needs to fix that. Our guest stars this week include Richard Jackal as Cadet Leo Tanner... Richard is one of those actors who has been in a bit of everything, on both big screen and small. Aside from a brief pause in his career while he was serving in the Merchant Marine during World War II, Richard was frequently cast in tough guy roles, a familiar face from the 1940s onward, appearing in a number of westerns and war movies, including The Sands of Iwo Jima. Other big screen appearances include Come Back Little Sheba, 310 to Yuma, and a co-starring role as Sergeant Bowron, and the Dirty Dozen. He landed an Oscar nomination for Best Supporting Actor for his role in 1971's Sometimes a Great Notion. But unlike many a certifiable movie star of his era, Richard had no problem taking TV roles either. He was a mainstay of the TV Playhouse anthologies of the 50s, and, get this, this episode was his second appearance as Cadet Leo Tanner. The character made his first appearance in a more minor role in West Point's fourth episode, The Honor Code, written by Gene's friend Don Brinkley. And you'll note this is not the first time that Gene and Don have conspired to reuse each other's characters and build up a little bit of a West Point cinematic universe. Richard made guest appearances in The Time Tunnel, The Outer Limits, The Wild Wild West, Mission Impossible, The Shaft TV series, and would be a regular or semi-regular cast member of such shows as Firehouse, Salvage One, Spencer for Hire, and even Baywatch. Richard died at the age of 70 in 1997. Bringing his signature steely gaze to the role of cadet John Bellman is actor Richard Davalos. Richard Davalos had already had a high profile as James Dean's brother in East of Eden in 1955. Both East of Eden and West Point were very early in Richard's acting career, on the big screen, you saw him in Cool Hand Luke, Battle Beyond the Stars, and Something Wicked This Way Comes, among many others. On the small screen, 
Richard put in appearances on One Step Beyond, The Rat Patrol, SWAT, Heart to Heart, and The Fall Guy. And you can also see him staring at you from the cover of the Smiths album, Strange Ways Here We Come. We lost Richard in 2016. Edward Platt guest stars as Colonel Bellman. If you were a fan of Get Smart, then you certainly know Edward Platt's face. He was the chief, giving Maxwell Smart his marching orders and frequently bailing him out of trouble in all but one episode of that series. You may also have seen Edward in North by Northwest, Rebel Without a Cause, Pollyanna, and Cape Fear. He was also a frequent flyer on TV, with guest starring credits on Men into Space, 77 Sunset Strip, The Twilight Zone, Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea, The Outer Limits, and Bewitched. Edward worked right up to the end of his life in 1974. We do have another one of these curious minor Trek connections here. Charles Maxwell, who plays the tactical officer who consults with Colonel Bellman, plays Virgil Earp in the original series Star Trek episode Spectre of the Gun. Now, for context, you also have to realize that even while he was a staff writer on West Point, Gene was actively selling scripts to other shows, mostly Ziv shows, and those scripts also had to be delivered on deadline. Remember the oil lease episode of Highway Patrol? That aired just a few days before Man of Action on West Point. Gene was interspersing his work on West Point with scripts for the Kaiser Aluminum Hour, Dr. Christian, Harbor Command, The Man from Texas, Boots and Saddles, Jane Wyman's Fireside Theater, and an unproduced script for Science Fiction Theater. A lot of this we don't even have in the archives. Some of it is completely lost media, no scripts, no nothing. We will cover what we can when the material is available. Also in that time frame, during Gene's time as a West Point staff writer, we have the earliest instance in the archive of Gene pitching an original series of his own. Probably not the first series pitch he ever wrote, but the earliest one where we have a copy of the documents in the archives. It's not uncommon, by the way, for even the greenest writers to be jotting down ideas for their own original projects. We've all done it. It doesn't mean it'll go anywhere, but you still jot it down. Even if you're the only person who ever sees it, it's a strangely satisfying thing to do. And hey, you never know where it might wind up, because look at who we're talking about here. It's a very good snapshot of how hungry the medium of television was for new talent in this era, when you consider how quickly Gene leveled up from a cop moonlighting as a freelance TV writer to a full-time staff writer on a series. Over time, the industry would start making new writers pay a lot more dues, figuratively speaking, before they could score that kind of a steady gig. But it was still the early days of TV as a medium, and Gene Roddenberry was hungry to prove that he could make a living crafting stories for the small screen. I've been wanting to have a talk with you. Sure, Dad. On a formal basis. I'm going to give you the same advice I'd give any cadet. No more, no less. Yes, sir. It appears to me that someone, perhaps even a close relative, has given you a wrong slant on our system here. I doubt that, sir. I have a pretty good source of information on that. Just in case you've misunderstood that source, let me give you the official word. We encourage rivalry here for one reason only, and that reason is not to build champions. Yes, sir. We don't care if a man is number one, or two, or less, so long as that man is doing his best. That cadet in line next to you today can be mighty important to you tomorrow. He may be laying down protective fire to save your life. He may be fighting to bring up troops or ammunition to save your position. He may be your commander. He may be your support. But he's going to be there somewhere, and you'll be counting on him to do his best. Yes, sir. I hope this means something to you. Act 1. Cadet Lieutenant Charles Thompson of Company M2 welcomes us to West Point yet again, and... Hey, did the cadet on guard duty behind him just get jumped? Man, rough neighborhood. Okay, not really. There are some ambush and hand-to-hand combat drills happening in the background, and Thompson's probably next, so a new narrator takes over. Colonel John Bellman Sr. Colonel Bellman begins recounting the story, with no small amount of pride, of his son's tryout for the Army wrestling team. Cadet John Bellman Jr. is grappling with fellow cadet Leo Tanner, 
perfectly good physical specimen, whom the elder Bellman notes seems like he's almost afraid of winning. Indeed, Leo doesn't win this match and receives advice on how to do better from both the wrestling team coach and Colonel Bellman. Cadet Bellman introduces Leo to his father. Colonel Bellman happens to be West Point's professor of social sciences, and Cadet Bellman is competing hard. He has his father's cadet record to beat. The colonel suggests that maybe Leo should look at not just outperforming his fellow cadets, but the colonel's record, too. The colonel continues to take an interest in Cadet Tanner. Leo's got a high IQ, his classroom performance places him near the top, but that's precisely the problem. Tanner never quite seems to reach the top. Why is that? On Sunday, every Sunday in fact, Cadet Bellman leaves campus and has dinner with his father. But on this particular Sunday, Colonel Bellman has extended a dinner invitation to Leo Tanner as well. When Leo arrives, he's a bit awkward and stiff. The colonel practically has to tell him to loosen up and be at ease and enjoy just a brief interlude of civilian life. But hey, dinner's on, and both cadets are amused to see that the colonel's rank doesn't mean much to the housekeeper, Maddie. She's really in charge. Over dinner, Colonel Bellman listens as Leo sings the virtues of his fellow cadet growing up in an army family, giving him early exposure to military discipline and giving him the edge, whereas Leo grew up as a farm boy. The colonel points out that his own upbringing was very similar to Leo's, and it certainly didn't stop him from making colonel. And it probably gives Leo some advantages as well. John Bellman asks his dad, Who are you rooting for, anyway? The colonel matter-of-factly replies, The best man. Act 2. Well, it's a horse race now. Leo Tanner's academic performance improves significantly, tying for first with Cadet Bellman in electrical engineering. John Bellman responds by hitting the books equally hard, forsaking downtime and even dinners with his dad to try to keep up. Bellman's roommates and his buddies notice the overnight change in his demeanor, and they don't like it. Leo drops by John's room in the barracks to mention thanking the colonel for his words of encouragement, but he gets a very icy response from John. It's clear that John is taking this all very personally. It's not just about competing for the best academic or athletic performance. He feels like he has a competitor for his father's affections. The fierce rivalry continues on the squash court to the point that Leo injures himself and winds up in the infirmary with a bandaged head. Colonel Bellman pays Leo a visit to see how he's doing, and then summons John to his office for a chat. But make no mistake, this isn't fatherly advice. This is official business. Colonel Bellman tries to remind his son that rivalry at West Point should only serve the purpose of spurring every cadet to do his best, not to make enemies out of young men who may someday be depending on each other in the field. Where a cadet ranks isn't as important as whether or not each cadet is delivering his peak performance. Without coming out and saying it, the colonel is trying to get across that the rivalry between his son and Leo Tanner is getting out of hand. But it doesn't seem like this talk changes the cadet's mind at all. He repeats his request to check out additional textbooks and is dismissed. The colonel sits down at his desk. What has he unleashed here? But where is Cadet John Bellman going with these textbooks? He's tutoring Leo while he's stuck in the infirmary. Leo doesn't take to it kindly. He's already getting notes from the classes he's missing, and he doesn't feel he needs John to bring him additional notes and even repeat the classroom lectures for him. But John is adamant, and he insists that he is not doing Leo any special favors. As John says, When I beat you, I want to win over the best you've got. But it still doesn't seem as if there's any love lost between them. And when Tanner is out of the infirmary and cleared to continue participating in athletics, the two cadets wind up head-to-head -head on the wrestling mat again. The competition is fierce. Even as they grapple, they continue their argument. Colonel Bellman shows up to observe the match, and he and the coach each note that it's hard to figure out who will come out on top. And finally, it's declared a draw. Even then, the cadets' rivalry continues until Leo lets slip that John has been tutoring him to help him keep his grades up. Even the colonel didn't know this, and it changes his perception of his son's attitude instantly. John hasn't been fixated on all-out victory. He's been acting as a teacher as well as a student. The colonel is impressed and suggests it's time for the cadets to resume their Sunday steak dinners at his house. 
One last question, the wrestling coach asks the colonel. Who is the best man? The colonel replies that it doesn't matter. With both on the same team, the army can't lose. The end. Short, sweet, to the point, just like any type of command would be, Earl. Well done on the recap. We have a really interesting new opening. Actually, in the last couple episodes, uh, let's go back to Jet Fighter. That was an interesting new opening. This is an interesting new opening with Charles C. Thompson because he's walking the perimeter along with a sentry guard. And sneak attack! What is up with that? <laughs> it was Okay, so we know that the actor uh, that plays Charles Thompson, we know that that's a role. But the two actors behind him who are doing the actual sneak attack to show, quote-unquote, how important survival is to West Point cadets in the Army, were they actors too? Because their stunt was less than desirable. That's a good question. I wish I had a good answer for that. (sighs) There's a lot of wrestling going on, and that's what the stunt was. Uh, We'll get back to the wrestling in a moment. But how much, Earl... I was thinking of you specifically when I was watching the early sports montage scenes showing all the different ways that men can physically improve themselves at the point. You didn't have a lot of basketball. You had a lot of like weightlifting, gymnastics and rope climbing and things like that. And a, wait for it, lot of wrestling. Also, did you know we finally got some some army football in there? We did. We did. But not as much as wrestling. Speaking of wrestling, so I know we don't really jump the timeline here. It's not a requirement for Mission Log Genealogy. But let's jump forward to Charlie X in the original series. Because is it me or are we seeing a pattern of Gene really liking wrestling analogies and metaphors in his shows? It is probably something that having gone through Army training, of course, the wrestling as athletic event is kind of its own thing, but you have to figure it is also taught as sort of entry-level hand-to-hand combat. Oh, very good. I like that observation. If it, yeah. If, you know, if there's no weapons and it's just you and some other guy, you've still got to find a way to put that guy down. And so I think that is, that's really the function of it in this episode is basically your entry point into training for hand-to-hand unarmed combat. Now I have these entire wrestling scenes completely overscored by the theme from Gamesters of Triskelion, the Star Trek combat music. It just adds a whole new complexity to what we're watching. Speaking of complex, I do love the character of Maggie. It's Maggie, right? Is it Maggie or Maddie? It could be Maddie or Maggie. Well, just as convoluted as that, is she Colonel Tanner's housekeeper or wife? (laughs) I kind of have her pegged as the housekeeper. That's what I got because too. Yeah. the I I kind of get the impression that she has been there a long time. We don't know what happened to Mrs. Tanner, right? Of course, there had to be a Mrs. Tanner, or else we wouldn't have Cadet Tanner. But one gets the impression that she is, yeah, she may have passed on at some point. Yeah, and so in some way, Maddie is you know kind of holding the household together. Yeah, because she kind of, you know, sticks it to both of them. Actually, there's a scene where uh, Leo comes over uh, and to the Tanner's house that he was invited over by the colonel. And she kind of puts them all in their place when she serves dinner or the steak dinner. Because she's like, I cooked. You guys are going to eat. And you're going to eat it hot because I cooked it hot. <laughs> yeah, and I think that's funny, you know, where Colonel Bellman points out, you know, oh, well, you know, you see what these stripes on my shoulder do for me outside of the... You know, outside of West Point, nothing. Oh, jeez. You know, I'm going to get Tanner and Bellman completely confused here. That's on me. But it reminds me of that scene. I'm not sure if uh, any of you have seen the uh, Hell or High Water, you know, with Jeff Bridges and, you know, Captain Kirk's very own Chris Pine or vice versa. There's a scene in a restaurant where this lady, who reminded me a lot of Maggie or Maddie, where she just asks both of these guys, these two Texas Rangers, what don't you want? And they're both experienced Texas Rangers who have stared down death in the face many times. And they're both terrified of this woman, you know, a veteran waitress of probably about 40 years. And she goes, what don't you want? Well, you didn't come here for this and you didn't come here for that. So what don't you want? (laughs) It's like, what a scene. That's who Maddie reminded me of. That's why I think she's been there a while. It's like, she knows things. She runs this house. Mm Mm-hmm. 
over dinner, I absolutely adored Leo Tanner's description of his hometown as, it's just a wide spot on the road. I have never heard that expression before, but growing up as I did in a larger town that was surrounded by much smaller rural towns, you know, which you would frequently visit, that is so perfect. I am totally stealing that phrase. Yeah, I want to know how much of, like, these scenes were written by Gene or written by, was it John Bennett? Jack Bennett. Jack Bennett, yeah. Gene has the teleplay credit, so... Now, sometimes teleplay credit versus story credit is a thing that is arbitrated by the Writers Guild. That balance of credits that Jack Bennett is only credited with the story leads me to believe that the script is entirely Gene's. But that is such a funny turn of phrase. It just it just jumped out and grabbed me. I loved it, and it's so incredibly economically descriptive. There's a lot of very economical writing, and I tried to flag all of the instances of this because there a, there is a lot of background information about the characters and their situations delivered here conversationally in a way that does not stick out as some kind of expositional info dump. Mm-hmm. It's very nicely done. Of course, there's also stuff that happens without any lines. Like that look between John and Leo after John's dad says he is rooting for whoever the best man is. Mm -hmm. Not a word is said, but right there you instantly know, it's on. So I, that was a great expression, you know, by, you know, by the actor who played uh, John. And I took a screenshot of that. And if you want to see said screenshot of what I'm describing... You can always join us at patreon.com slash mission log to sign up for uh, your membership and then your exclusive rights to see this uncut footage. Because he looks just like Tom Brady in that scene. <laughs> he looks, I was, I was like, I put this particular still side by side with a shot of Tom Brady, like when he's practicing and he's very intense. They are cut from the same cloth, that separated at birth kind of thing. Like me and Richard Jekyll, that's just... Okay, so you're going to get that both ways here in this episode. You're going to get either Richard Jekyll, Richard Jekyll. If you have a pronunciation that is specific and documented, let us know, because all we know is what we know and what we can read off paper. Getting back to the economical writing, in Act 2, when Cadet Bellman is in the barracks and apparently staying in the barracks, his nose is in the books full-time, his roomie says, you spend all day Sunday here. Uh, this is a very conversational way of telling us he's skipping steak dinners with Dad. Mm-hmm. If he is staying in the barracks all Sunday studying. And then John says to his friend, the important thing is to beat him, him being Leo Tanner. And I saw this directly as a page taken out of Robert Hamilton's book when he was talking about beating his brother, Joel. It, there's so much of the same tone here. I'm going to touch on that a little bit later in discussion. Later, when John and Leo kind of face off, you know, you better stick to squash instead. Mm-hmm. You know, because Leo makes this offer, you know, hey, I was heading down to the squash court, but if you'd rather solve this on the wrestling mat, let's go. And this is like, wow claws are out and I found myself wondering why was that not the act break because I was almost expecting a fade for a commercial break there yeah that was a good dramatic pause too and like what happened to Leo also I think if we're going to do the the male version of claws are out it has to be snicked right because that's Wolverine claws Wolverine yeah right? exactly snicked yes. snicked uh, S-N-I-K-T for all of you who are uh, doing the AI algorithmic transcript of this when the colonel visits Leo Tanner in the infirmary, is it me, or do all the cadets on, in West Point have literally the best robes ever made? We've seen the bathrobes before. We saw it uh, in the operator in the Martinet when a lot of the cadets were there like after hours, and they're making sandwiches with or without fried onions. Your mileage may vary, as they say. But they have, like, their robes are, like, all covered with the same insignia that they have on their uniforms, as they have on their uh, outerwear, their, their, their trench coats. I mean, I don't know where you buy these, man. I really want one. I think we've both commented on just how 
cozy and warm the outerwear looks. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know if this is a constant at West Point or if this was just a thing of this era. Wow, they, they sure make it look comfortable. Now, let's talk about something slightly less comfortable, and that is the bit of business when Cadet Bellman is summoned to Colonel Bellman's office, and the Colonel is going to give him a piece of advice, and, he's, and Cadet Bellman says, Sure, Dad. Oh, no, this is a formal conversation. Oh, yeah. And John has to snap back to attention mm -hmm. because he was, he, was at, he was at easing before anyone told him to at ease. Yeah. And it was just like, oh, you, you know, not, not quite a clause out moment, but uh, definitely it kind of went back to earlier in the story when they were telling over dinner, mm -hmm. Cadet Bellman failing to salute his dad his first day at West Point. Right. Passed him like, you know, hey, dad. It's like, oh, no, you salute. Right. And they touched on that again uh, in an earlier episode that uh, both you and I really enjoyed. And that was uh, with, you know, with Hamilton Brothers, you know, in uh, Thicker Than Water, where Robert is there at you know, he's in basic training camp and he sees his brother and he goes, hey, bro, what's up? You got, you know, can you let us slide on a couple things like not having to actually clean our room and stuff? And he goes, you will address me as senior cadet or whatever they called him, Hamilton, Mr. You know, plebe. Yeah. He goes, you know, suck in that chin, stick out that chest, you know, snap your shoulders back. And you're like, OK, this is business time. B-I-D-N-E-S-S -S for all of you who are transcribing this as we're talking business time. The look on Cadet Bellman's face when he walks out of his dad's office, looking, you know, just a bit unhappy. I found myself wondering if he was thinking to himself, man, I want to blow up the water mains now. How did that one guy do that? We were talking about the um, economy of writing in this episode, which I think is probably some of the best we've seen. I love how Gene wrote the dialogue between John and Leo in the infirmary right after this conversation that uh, John had with his father, the colonel. There's a whole other hours-long conversation we can have about the psychology of the only way to be the best is to beat the best. Even if I, in this case, would have been John, have to make someone better, in this case Leo, than me to do it. And it reminds me, just because I love Carl Weathers, uh, rest in peace, rest in power, Carl, he said this to Rocky. He said, I am the best. And I've beaten the best. I have retired more men than Social Security. Like, that kind of <laughs> arrogance, right? There's a conversation going on during the wrestling match, which is kind of bizarre, because it almost seems like no one else hears it happening. And I'm sure some of that is the sound editing going on, because the dialogue has to be audible. So we can't have the other cadets, you know, cheering on the two who are on the mat and creating a bunch of noise that makes it difficult to hear that dialogue. But we were just recently talking about the stage whisper, mm -hmm. and, and here it is in action, and it just, it makes that scene a little bit weird, almost like, you know, we're going to hug it out. I was actually, in this scene, waiting for one of them to do actual real bodily harm to the other, like break an arm or break a leg or do something that would jeopardize their career because they took it too far. I'm glad it resolved the way it resolved, where it was more of, let's... Let's be the best that we can and let fate sort it out. And in this case, fate was a tie. And then obviously there was the catch line at the end of the army is now being served by two great cadets instead of one great cadet and a lost cadet. So I thought that was interesting. The other thing that occurred to me during that second wrestling match. Okay, maybe this is just me and maybe I'm a bit of a wimp. But if I'm the guy who has just had a head injury that had me sidelined for weeks, I want to wear a helmet like the other guy's wearing. Yeah. Well, see, that's... I don't know wrestling all that well. but And maybe they did this to make a visual point. But Leo wasn't wearing a helmet, and you could tell who he was because Richard Jekyll has really light blonde hair. And then John Bellman, he was wearing a wrestler's cap, and usually those are worn because you don't want to have your ears boxed or grabbed. I'm wondering why why both they don't wear the same thing because I wouldn't want my ears boxed or grabbed. It was probably down to a directorial decision 
to make sure we can see who is who. And my gut feeling is that's probably what it boils down to. We have to be able to see which one is Leo. We've got to be able to see his blonde hair. And so for some reason, he is not going to wear his protective gear. And also, keep in mind, this is a, a very different kind of wrestling. You know, this is wrestling as an athletic event as opposed to what a lot of people automatically think of if you say wrestling to them today. You know, so it's not like they're having this conversation and then Leo walks off and, What's this? Cadet Tanner is coming back with a steel chair! All right, Norman, there is a lot going on in this episode. I think we both found a few things to talk about here. In a way, I found this story to be a story of parenting by proxy. We've mentioned the Hamilton brothers from their episode before. John and Leo might as well be brothers here. But it hits all the beats of a story about parenting two brothers. There are intense rivalries. They are jockeying to be dad's favorite. Which really makes me wonder where Leo's dad is. Is he still around? Did he not give Leo the kind of validation or support that he needed so that he is not worried about vying for that from someone else's dad? Or, actually, you know, we were talking about the the economy of writing before, and so there is stuff here that may be implicit, that Leo's dad may be the underlying reason why Leo doesn't stick up for his own viewpoint in class and elsewhere. It could be that Leo's dad made him the man he is today, and now the army has to make him a new and arguably better man. There's a line of dialogue where Leo thinks it's nice that the Bellmans have a military tradition in their family, which, without an info dump, without an autobiographical info dump, that's telling us right there, Leo's father was not in the military. And so, again, a very economical way of getting that information across. Now, Colonel Bellman repeats a point that was made all the way back in the operator and the martinet that whether this fellow cadet ends up as your commander or under your command, you have to be able to count on each other. It's very interesting to see, at the very least, Gene repeatedly making this point in his West Point scripts. In today's action storytelling, however, there is a huge emphasis on the army of one. You know, you alone must fight the war. And I think some of this is kind of like everyone learned the wrong lessons from John Rambo. Do you think that we would see this same point being made now about depending on each other? Really great points. I want to kind of like break these down and address these like one by one, because as we said before, you know, on not only just mission log when we cover Star Trek, but also for Mission Log here in Genealogy, where Earl and I don't really have the luxury or choose not to see each other's nose before we record. And you fed right into several points that I actually wanted to make, you know, independently, especially what you're talking about by the parenting by proxy story. I'd like to, to talk about that first, because we're both focusing on a very central scene I mentioned a quote from it earlier in observations and, you know, you kept coming back to it, you know, with lines like, you know, where when Leo said where I lived is just kind of like a wide spot, you know, on a street or however he said that. Basically, a, a crucial part of this entire episode comes from the eight to ten minutes maybe of when they have dinner at the at Colonel Tanner's house and they get to know Leo a little bit more and Colonel Tanner is trying to investigate why someone with such great potential is coming up second best all the time by his own design. You know, it's an interesting psychological study because maybe when he sees Leo, he's like, if I weren't here and if John wasn't raised in the way that I raised him in this military tradition family, then he may have been another Leo and I would want somebody to look out for John in the way that now I'm looking out for Leo. But he, like you said, he didn't understand the dynamic that he unleashed upon these two young men. And I, I wanted to get a little bit into that because 
If ever there was a scene that proves that West Point was a recruiting tool for the U.S. Army, it's this scene. And in particular, starting at minute 822 in this episode, the Colonel and John, the Tanners, are having Leo over for dinner, as we've mentioned. And I think we're trying to establish that the Colonel has ulterior motives to try and persuade Leo to be better than he is. He's taken a personal interest in Leo. But Leo admits to being intimidated by other cadets, like John, who had a leg up of being born into army life. Leo believes he's nothing more than a farm boy from a small town who caught a lucky break by scoring high on West Point's entrance exam. And the colonel says, in response to that, where do you think most of our cadets come from? And then Leo responds, well, not from Millville, sir. And the colonel responds, uh, that's where you're dead wrong. I came from a sort of Millville myself, only much smaller. Now, why is this scene important? Because not only does it economically illustrate what Gene is trying to write in this story or what Jack Bennett is trying to write in this story, but this is where the true power of sitting in front of the TV set is understood. Imagine somewhere out there in the target audience of West Point, there is a potential Leo Bellman, a young man in a small town or from a small town, 500 people or so, right? With one major intersection, one high school, one of everything, looking for a way out to better himself and to be somebody. And then he watches this episode and sees himself in Leo Bellman. So this is the sheer marketing power of this scene. And I'm just, I'm impressed and I'm staggered by how life-changing and influential it could have been then, because it certainly still is now. I, I do want to make one lighthearted observation here. Hmm. Hey, let's examine all aspects of the recruiting tools going on here simultaneously in this episode. You have discipline. You have potential. You could be the best. And if that's not enough for you, we have got super comfy robes. Sure thing. Super comfy robes, you got all the gym stuff, you can play football, basketball if you want to, and certainly wrestling if you so desire. You know, but yeah, it's just there's so much going on in this twenty-eight minutes worth of storytelling that and and you said before, Earl, in observations, it's so smoothly done and slid in that you don't really get until you watch it over and over and over again, like like the way we do, how much is being told in this story. Now to go to your whole issue with, you know, Rambo the Army of One, is that the wrong message? You know, it's interesting that he didn't start off that way. You know, it was, uh, it was you know, in first blood. Right, right. And you know? that's, what I'm, that's what I'm saying is that Hollywood and perhaps the audience got the wrong takeaway from that film. You know, first blood was a, a, a kind of sidestepping into a conversation about first blood. Mm. That was a movie about how we treat our returning veterans. Yeah. The fact that we got this big muscular firefight at the end of it, that was not the point of the movie, but that's what the franchise became that grew out of that movie. And so it's a bit of a case where, okay, you learned all the wrong lessons from this. Yeah, and it's interesting that the superhero movies are the ones that are getting that message right, and maybe that's the new vehicle for all of these disparate and, you know, uh, very driven personalities like your Tony Starks or and Steve Rogers in particular, and maybe Captain America. Maybe this is why Captain America is so important, because he is the World War II archetype of the leader that needs a team to function together in order to defeat the enemy. Right. Because it was on him. It was always on Captain America to inspire the team to work together, to resolve their differences and you know, unify their strengths and become the Avengers, right? Now, obviously, it's really on the shoulders of, you know, Iron Man positioned in the MCU. But really, when it really comes down to it, at the end of the day, it's how do you work together as a team as opposed to an individual? And maybe that's the way that you get that message across nowadays because, you know, there are certain feelings out there in the public space about how the military functions, why they function, and why they exist. I think it's fascinating to see... Gene making that point, and not, as you pointed out, it's not just in this episode. We've had some super obvious episode titles like Jet Flight, 
we've had some kind of head scratchers, like a double reverse. I want to play the title game here with this episode. What was the command? What command was given? Who gave the command? Who followed it? You got any ideas there? You know, this is the one time where I'm like directly addressing a question or a note that you put in here because it's a great question. Because sometimes, again, Gene's titles are obvious and they mean something specifically. Thicker than water, coming from blood is thicker than water. It's a well-known axiom about family and the and the responsibility that you have, even if you don't always agree. You know, or the operator in the martinet. You know, very kind of abstract in in its terminology, but very apt. You know, to describing the two central characters. I don't think that the command is an actual. Let me see if I remember my English correctly. It is a noun or an object. Yeah, and there is you a know, definite article in front of it. The command. Yeah. So I think the command, as I interpret it, applies to the command that Colonel Bellman has over the two men, almost like an influence he has, the power of command, the power of suggestion over these two young men and their development and their desperation to win his approval. I mean, the colonel didn't really have to do anything other than speak a few words of encouragement to Leo or a few words of inspiration, quote unquote, to John, his son to spark off kind of like this controversy, this rivalry between them, because it was already there, right? And you said that, is it parenting by proxy? That's another thing that I didn't get a chance to, to respond to. That is the case in this, the command of him over their affection, right? And I'm going to get to that a little bit later on in morals, meanings, and messages. I mean, think about the difference of tone that the colonel had with Leo at the dinner table, sympathetic, understanding, and with John, discipline, duty, you know, family honor. Those are two ways of approaching the exact same personality, but he only has one son. And it's almost like Leo is the other son. He's like, again, the the Robert Hamilton to Joel's, you know, John. And there is a similarity there. And it's something that I wanted to talk about in terms of the pattern that's coming out of Gene's writing as we're seeing it again because we have the luxury of so many episodes back to back instead of one or twos we actually see him probably refining a lot more of the storytelling with themes that are a through line like through each episode and I felt that command in many ways was kind of like the unfinished version or an alternate version of Thicker Than Water so I keep bringing up Joel and Robert Hamilton you know as kind of like the maybe like the precursors to uh, John and to Leo. Because take a look at it this way. If you look at a side by side comparison of these two episodes, one, Joel and Robert in Thicker Than Water are just like Leo and John here. Robert and Leo are intelligent, talented cadets, but for reasons of personal insecurity, aren't able to reach their fullest potential without some type of external push. And competition is lack for a better word weaponized in both of them and focused and focuses them on their obstacle that impedes their respective success. For Robert Hamilton, it's the older perfect brother, Joel. And for Leo, it's not just Cadet Bellman, but it's the fact that he's the son to the colonel who Leo admires. But here's where the story is flipped. In Thicker Than Water, it's the lessons learned about family, duty, and honor, and loyalty that brings the brothers together. Conversely, in this episode in Command, Leo and John reconciled knowing that they both misinterpreted the colonel's expectations. And now they rely on trying to push each other to be the best. And I think that even the operator in the Martinet tries to get this point across as well. But it was just that was the earliest script that we saw from Gene in West Point, And it hasn't matured into this, you know, from that time. This, I think, here is kind of like the pinnacle of maybe that theme or these themes moving forward. What do you think? I, I would kind of like to know what of his own experiences Gene was bringing into this because he's making this point over and over again. And I, I think it was very much foregrounded in The Operator, in The Martinet, and in Thicker Than Water. Mm -hmm. This is something that he feels is important enough. This theme has been in three out of the five episodes we've covered. We 
have come to the end of our discussion, Earl, and I command you, I command you to sum it up for us. How did you feel about the episode? And as we do here on Mission Log and Mission Log Genealogy, we took a look at these episodes and try and find the morals, meanings, and messages contained therein because, as we say at the very beginning, this is part of the evolutionary process of Gene Roddenberry becoming the writer that we all know from his probably most famous work, which is Star Trek. But there is a path that is happening. There is an evolution that is happening. And let's start off the conversation with how you felt about the command, Earl. I feel like maybe part of this episode is a bit of a metaphor because it seems like Gene is wrestling with a lot of issues simultaneously in this one. Golf clap. Golf clap. One of the big ones, one of the big takeaways from this episode, there may be competitive elements to life. Natural rivalries may arise. But life is not a zero-sum game where you have to end up with all the marbles while someone else ends up with none of the marbles. It doesn't have to work like that. And this is something I feel really strongly about. You should cheer for other people's successes. Even if they are technically competing against you, I've never really understood being jealous of other people's successes, especially if they're my friends. The response should be to be encouraging and to be encouraged. This might be someone who helps you through their contacts and connections and their knowledge. They may have valuable advice for you. You don't have to be dismissive about other people's successes. You don't have to talk trash about them. The fact that they beat the odds should surely give you hope that you can do that too. Because again, life is not a zero-sum game, or it should not be treated that way. Let me put it that way. And again, I found it striking that having the best army full of the best men is being emphasized over the army of one trope that comes much later in pop culture, particularly in pop culture treatment of military characters and themes. This question I'm going to leave everyone with is way beyond the scope of this episode of West Point. <laughs> Frankly, it's way beyond the scope of this podcast, but... When did this change societally? When did we become so fixated on the army of one and, you know, the rugged individualist and, you know, to hell with the collective good? How did this gradually become normalized? And, you know, it's gotten to a point now where it's a very toxic thing. You know, in current and modern discourse... You know, you're going to be ruggedly individual. You know, you're not going to take that vaccine. You're not going to do this thing that's going to help people other than yourself. What has that cost us as a society that the focus has gone from we to me? Now, that's a question that occurs to me after watching this episode and noticing Gene's repeated emphasis on teamwork, building the best team instead of building the best rugged individual. So I, I have lots of thoughts, some of which actually have something to do with this episode. I will take the off-ramp here, Norm, and let you tell us what you found. I love the question that you posed here about the army of one, because I agree with you in, in many cases. I just want to like Look at the perspective of the Army's motto of the Army of One. I have a friend who uh, at one point in time was a recruiter, and he's saying that, you know, how, how difficult it was, you know, a few years ago to actually vet viable candidates, you know, for officer positions in the Army. And I was thinking about that motto, and he's like, well, what did that motto mean to you, you know, when you joined? And he said, well, it's a reference in one to personal achievement, you being the one that's being able to bring your best to this entire collective body, which is the army, and that army moves together as one with the best. That's West Point. That's what West Point is trying to establish, you know, in and we the viewers and in, in the context of gene scripts at least, because we can't technically talk about the other ones that that's not on the purview of our show. So maybe that's one interpretation of the one. But the Zathra says, not the one. And if you get that reference, we are now instantly friends, if we weren't already. With the exception 
of the secret defense of 117, which I, I think you and I both agree, Earl, that that is an outlier this early on for Gene's scripts. And maybe that's that's the truth of Gene at this time, where he wants to be. But with the exception of that script, this is my absolutely favorite script by Gene Roddenberry. And now, because I didn't read your trivia, and with you know Jack Bennett behind it as well uh, to date, because as we're examining the evolution of Gene's pre-Star Trek writing career, this is something that I feel it's really in line with where we are going to end up with certain archetypes of characters that we all know and love in the dynamics and the interpersonal relationships thereof. But this episode also connects with me on a very personal level. And, and as you know, with the other Mission Log podcast, you know, I get sometimes personal about it when the episodes are very affecting as this was. And I, I you know, more often than I'd like to admit or even reflect on, I saw my younger self in both Tanner and Bellman in this episode, for better or worse. I have a very specific connection with the characterizations of these two and the nature of this script and how it illustrates the timeless power of the competitive nature in humanity, both men and women. And how this mentally was fostered in both genders at an early age, from the moment we understand the concept of becoming better than, or perhaps being lesser than. Now, let me explain this a little bit. This isn't to say that I was raised or treated unfairly. Far from it. I was raised by a wonderful family. My parents, I adore beyond measure, you know, but what I'm referring to is the kind of educational and social institutions that I was raised in to be educated, groomed, and polished into a future leader or a business person or a social pillar of society. Think of my growing up in the context of movies like Dead Poet Society or School Ties. If you know those movies and you have a better understanding of my kind of upbringing. And the most interesting thing that I found by comparison is how right Gene was about both Bellman and Tanner competing on a variety of different levels against each other against their own inner struggles, and for the affection of, of the colonel, even for Leo, who wasn't his son. And I remembered myself and other young men who I went to school with, with, we were completely driven by these very same dynamics, especially the approval of a faculty member who we would be, for lack of a better word, obsessed with in seeking his approval, both as a teacher and our coach, because he was the pitch-perfect walking and talking embodiment of who we wanted to be respected somewhat feared handsome successful with a perfect family a beautiful wife two strong handsome boys the whole nine yards but what they don't tell you in these kinds of environments is how to balance this internal struggle and as boys we weren't even young men yet we had no concept of what kind of emotional turmoil we were subjecting ourselves to just for the slightest glimmer of approval from an authority figure. But later on, as I achieved a certain distance and perspective from that part of my life, I'm able to appreciate what that was. And when I watch an episode like this episode, like Command, I can truly appreciate how that competitive nature helped shape me, but at the same time also how it has adversely affected me as well. Because if you're always focused on achieving goals and competing to simply do just that, then you may not even be competing to achieve your own personal goals to begin with. Yeah, and I think this gets into an area where insecurity has been weaponized by society. Advertising is practically built on insecurity. You don't want to be outcast. You don't want to be a pariah. You don't want to be not in the in crowd. So drink this, smoke this, drive one of these, wear one of these. And hey, if you can't afford that, we have packaged debt to sell you as a product. And at some point, you have to gain enough perspective and enough confidence in yourself that you're able to withstand that from whichever direction it's coming. 
Mission Log Genealogy is produced by Roddenberry Entertainment. Special thanks to the Roddenberry Repertory Players. Our cast this week featured Matthew Corey as Colonel Bellman and Sam Kogan as Cadet John Bellman. If you would like to support us directly, you can do so at patreon.com slash mission log for early access to shows and the Mission Log Discord. If you have any material that might be of interest to us that isn't already in the Roddenberry Archive, drop us a line at missionlog at roddenberry.com. Our website is missionlogpodcast.com. On the next genealogy, the manhunt. Special thanks to consulting producers Matt Esposito, Homer Frizzell, Tom Kozak, Julie Miller, Mike Richards, Mike Shabel, Paul Shadwell, and David Takechi. This is a Roddenberry podcast. For more great podcasts, visit podcast.roddenberry.com.